Morning, everyone. I'm Reg Joseph, a Vice President of Alberta Innovates. I'd like to welcome you to the Health Policy Speaker Series, uh, presented in partnership with the Institute of Health Economics, represented here by John Spruill, who's there in the back. The Health Policy Speaker Series is jointly uh, organized between Alberta Innovates and the Institute of Health Economics. It's a series of features that expert, uh, present, sorry, features, <laughs> features health uh, policy field in scholarship, leadership, who have led to successful improvements in health system and the health status of populations. Today marks our sixth presentation for 2016. I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge a few uh, special guests in the room today. Uh, Dr. Verna Yu from Alberta Health Services, President and CEO, as well as I saw Justin Reamer here as well, who's the uh, Assistant Deputy Minister from Health. On November 1st, the four Alberta Innovates Corporations in the province merged into one single entity. As you know, our services, tools, and expertise, partnerships, and funding support a broad re range of research innovation activity from discovery to application with a focus on accelerating commercial outcomes. Alberta Innovates and its subsidiaries will support our clients in the public and private sectors to develop and apply innovations in focused market center clusters in smart agriculture, clean energy, and health innovation. The work we do not only benefits Alberta, but the entire country. It's my privilege now to introduce this morning's speaker, Ken Spears. Ken Spears is the Canadian Director and Regional Vice President of Boston Scientific. He began his medical device career in 1991 with Abbott Laboratories and joined Boston Scientific in Canada as the Director of Cardiology. 2005, Ken was promoted to the Canadian Director of Boston Scientific. He currently serves on the Medic Board of Directors and recently joined the Excite Management Board of Directors. Ken is an active health system advocate focused on improving patient outcomes, health system value for money, and evidence adoption of the innovation health technology. Please join me in welcoming Ken Spears this morning. Thanks, Ken. So good morning, everyone. So I shook a lot of uh, cool hands this morning, a little uh, chilly in Edmonton. As I say, it, uh, cold hands, warm heart, and I think it makes for good hockey fans, so I know that about Edmonton. So a couple of things before I get going. I know uh, I appreciate the introduction, Reg. Thank you. I do want to acknowledge as well um, the sponsors for the morning's event. Obviously, Alberta Innovates and uh, the Institute for Health Economics here in Alberta. It's important that I get in, uh, the opportunity to speak with you. I've got a few ideas that I like to share. And um, before I do that, though, um, some con connections back from me to Edmonton and and to Alberta. So. Um, I am an Albertan, so I was raised in a small town called Lloydminster uh, on the border, so not far from here. So uh, my parents couldn't decide what province they wanted to be in, so they chose a border town. That's the kind of where I ended up. But on the Alberta side, so I was on the Alberta side, schooled at the University of Alberta, um, met my wife, well, actually my first job here, my first job at Xerox uh, here in Edmonton, so Edmonton's a special place. Met my wife uh, at the Rosen Crown, which was at the time... <laughs> I know, I know, it's not overly romantic. Um, but at the time, it was the Hilton. So it was the Hilton, I think since became the Four Seasons, and now I believe is Sutton. So, but the Rosen Crown remains, I think. The Rosen Crown is still there. The Rosen Crown is still there. So married not far from here as well at uh, St. Joe's Basilica on Jasper Avenue. I think it's a church that became famous after Wayne Gretzky was married there. It's the only connection I've got with Wayne Gretzky. And um, two daughters, both born here in Edmonton. So my oldest, Jenna, and it reminds me just how long it's been. My youngest, Kristen, Jenna's finishing her fifth year of medical school. And uh, my youngest, Kristen's uh, in the process of wrapping up her second year law school at Osgoode in Toronto. So uh, Edmonton and the province of Alberta has been very kind uh, to me and, and my family. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning to talk about that. From a professional perspective, um, I bring 25 years of healthcare, Canadian healthcare experience uh, to this uh, conversation this morning. Uh, the last 12 of that as the uh, Vice President and, and uh, Director of uh, Boston Scientific. So Boston Scientific, for those of you who don't know, is a multinational um, device manufacturer, innovator. And uh, we represent seven business therapies, so we're focused on seven therapies. We do about $8 billion in sales a year, 25,000 employees worldwide, and our market cap's around $30 billion. So it's a big organization. We're relevant globally, and we're certainly relevant here in Canada. 
So from, if I'm not, uh, and Reg mentioned this, when I'm not uh, focusing on Boston Scientific customers and, and my team, I'm doing a lot of work with, with Medic, and it's been a, a real eye-opener uh, working with the Western group. I see Bob and Stephen here. Uh, I do a lot of work with Bob and Stephen as the Western liaison for Medic into the Medic Board of Directors in Toronto. And as, uh, as Reg mentioned as well, I've been spending some time uh, as a, uh, a managing member of Mars Excite, which gives me a different perspective as well. It's an accelerator for SMEs and new technologies into the Ontario space. So uh, with that and all that uh, cornucopia of information, I hope to engage you in, in some new thoughts, some new ideas this morning as I move through my presentation. One of the key themes that I want to talk about is the fact that I find myself too often engaged in conversations around cutting and around rationing of resources in an already scarce healthcare environment. And I'd like to change the narrative, uh, and I'm gonna do that through this presentation with a focus on winning. I don't think that we have enough balance on the winning side of that equation. And I wanna remind the room that, you know, and, and caution the room that as we enter into those conversations, it's important to understand that the absence of losing isn't winning. Right, so I do want to focus on winning, and, and I believe winning is, is something different. I believe winning allows us to be in a position where we can shape the future of our health care in a way that we're proud of. I also believe that winning offers bounty and uh, more rewards for all of health care stakeholders, the patients, um, the care providers, and the government payers. So we're going to be talking a lot about winning. And one of the metaphors that I'm going to use for winning, and one of the enablers that we're going to talk a lot about, is the enabler of innovative medical technologies and the bounty that comes from employing them responsibly and efficiently. So some of the conversations I'm sure you've been engaged in around medical technologies, and that's a conversation where medical technologies enable uh, the uh, benefits for patients. Benefits for patients, outcomes, for example, access to care, and when we do that properly, we can even get outcomes and access to care to align and drive through system savings. That's a nice fit. But I'm going to tease out something else in addition to those already predefined advantages of medical technologies. And that something else is this. When we do this right, and I believe that Albert is leading in those efforts, and I'll talk about that in a second. When we do this right, I think we can use innovative medical device technologies to attract investment. Attract investment, big investment from multinational organizations like the one I work for. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how that's done. So before we get into that, I think it's appropriate that you understand how multinational enterprises think and how they make investment decisions. So let's take a look at what I've got for you here. And I think one of the key pieces here is that um, to understand how multinationals think and how they invest, you need to understand the importance of innovation. Innovation is super important to companies like mine and other multinational medical device companies. The reason it's so important, and it differs from pharma, by the way, because the product life cycles are so short. Product life cycles in med device are anywhere from three to five years. So it is a constant churn of research and development. And in this particular space, the day you stopped innovating, the day you stop innovating is the day that you start to become irrelevant in the medical device space. So it's super important, it's critical to our business models that we continue to innovate. And that explains sort of the second point that I brought up. So with innovation being as important as it is, Medical device companies spend a lot, invest a lot in R&D. So the ideation, creation, on through to commercialization, that cycle, that pathway is really, really important. We spend a lot of money. As you can see from the top 10 medical device companies, and know there's some pharma numbers in there too, but um, what I want you to remember is that we spend a lot. It's a big space. It's a big opportunity. It's around $20 billion, anywhere from 10 to $20 billion this space. Uh, companies like mine are doling out to partners around the world to help them drive products and drive innovation and understand patient needs and understand provider needs. And we're gonna to get to a slide in a few slides that talks about how some countries are angling to get a bigger piece of that $20 billion research and development um, opportunity. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute. 
The other thing you need to know about um, multinationals, especially medical devices, is that they're opportunistic, right? We'll go where we get the biggest advantage. So we'll go to France if there's an advantage in working with France, Great Britain. And, and the idea that we're looking for is we're looking to co-invest, co-innovate with these partners so that we learn more about our products. We learn more about the markets we serve. We learn more about the patients. And then we take that information and we scale and that forms the foundation for our success in launching these new innovative products around the world. So that's the real advantage of moving first, understanding, taking the friction out of the innovation process within the environment because multinationals value that experience and we're willing to pay for it. So it's not a big surprise that big part of my job, knowing the importance of innovation to a multinational, big part of my job is to sell and advocate for the Canadian healthcare system within my own company. I'm trying to draw my own company resources and if I do a good job at that, we bring those resources into Canada. We invest in Canada. We invest in Canadian patient outcomes. We invest in uh, the training of our good smart physicians. We invest in Canadian academic centers. That's a perfect scenario for me. And in doing that, I find myself competing with people who do my job but represent France and people do my job who represent Great Britain. So it's a competition within my own company to pull a finite number of resources from my organization into the environments that we represent. So in that way, I think we're sort of aligned, depending on where you come from and in the nature of the role you play in healthcare, we're aligned in that way. Um, I'm looking for investments to make in our patients. I'm looking for investments to make in our academic centers. I'm looking for investments to make in our payer environment, et cetera. But I have to say this becoming increasingly more challenging. Uh, it's become increasingly more challenging because, as I mentioned, one of those key enablers, one of those key drivers, those lead indicators, is the ability to adopt innovation. So as we bump up against challenges, funding challenges, and we come up against more friction, and we see that innovation starts to slow down, it becomes tougher and tougher to pull and advocate for those resources, for those investments, and bring them into Canada. And that's why, on this slide, I'm super excited to be here in Alberta this morning. Because Alberta's different. Alberta's different. Alberta's challenging conventional thinking. Alberta is leading the thinking, the new thinking required to pull through, create a process that pulls through innovation in a responsible way and in an effective way. And I have to tip my hat to the folks involved in the initiative, many of you in this room, uh, stakeholders and leaders of that initiative and supporters of that initiative, and I'm referring to the SCN Medic initiative. Now that SCN Medic initiative, for those of you who may not be aware, really is, uh, the goal of it is to design a process, a new process that selects appropriate innovation to, to bring into the system and um, takes the friction out and enables the faster and more effective adoption and diffusion of these meaningful innovations into the Alberta health environment. So this thinking is leading Canada. It's absolutely leading the thinking in Canada. Um, you're well ahead of any other jurisdiction here. And again, I think what's, what's required right now, you've done a lot of good work. There's some momentum there. And I encourage the folks who are either in that initiative or supporting that initiative to keep pressing forward because, as I dare say, the rest of Canada is looking in on Alberta and they're looking for direction and guidance on how to do this themselves. Nobody's got that secret sauce yet on how to formulate a process that enables the effective adoption diffusion of uh, medical technologies into the healthcare system. And I believe that Alberta's closest, as mentioned, um, to solving this. And I believe when they do, there's huge rewards waiting for you out there. One you've probably talked about before, so that's the enabler of better patient outcomes. That's the enabler of better access to patients to the healthcare system. And I think we can accomplish both of those simultaneously while we cut costs and, and we bring a more efficient treatment to the healthcare system. I think that's a nice package and you can accomplish that with the appropriate selection and adoption of the right technologies done responsibly. And this is the other piece that I, I really want to focus on as well. When you do that right, you're going to get the attention of companies like mine. You're going to get the attention of multinational 
uh, medical device um, innovators. And they're going to want to understand what you're doing. They're going to want to be a part of it, and they're going to want to invest in it. And I believe that if you do this really well, that investment from industry can be meaningful. Meaningful enough to create a positive influence on your overall economy, to support the knowledge economy, the shift from uh, the dependence that you have today, and as Canadians we have today on the extraction economy, and move towards uh, a more self-sufficient knowledge economy. And oh, by the way, when we do that, and resources start to come in like talent and money and infrastructure and training and those types of roles and jobs, those engage with the SMEs. And this is a wonderful coexistence between industry, healthcare and SMEs to start to create a really meaningful cluster around the innovation of medical technologies. So um, on this note, as I mentioned, I, I think you're in the best place and, and you're, you're certainly leading and you're positioned best in Canada to take advantage of, of this strategy. Now I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that we've got to overcome. I've only got one slide. I think everyone's acutely aware of some of the challenges that we face in healthcare, but I want to level set the understanding because these are some of the challenges that we're going to overcome, and then I'll share how we win with these, with these technology strategies. So this is a, a depiction of the growth of healthcare in Canada. It's not important. The absolutes aren't important. You'll see that's, uh, uh, that's the current dollars right there. And you can see from 1975 to the year 2000, healthcare doubled from $50 billion to $100 billion, and then doubled again from 2000 to 2010, from 100 to $200 billion. And today we sit at around $219 billion as a national healthcare spend. That in itself is not a challenge. The challenging part is that at the same time, um, this healthcare spend is, is driving up based on the grain of our population, our economy slowed down. Because we're an extraction economy and our extraction economy is flatlined, we'll expect a GDP of somewhere just over 1% this year. And that isn't even necessarily the problem. And the way this problem manifests is that we end up in these, these huge political challenges where in the biggest provinces in Canada, the four biggest provinces in Canada, BC, Alberta, Quebec and Ontario, we're spending 50% of all the available tax revenue to support health care. And that's creating huge political issues. That's creating something called crowding out. So the healthcare budget as it swells is crowding out education, it's crowding out infrastructure, it's crowding out social programs. And oh, by the way, as, as critical as that sounds today, take a look at where it's going tomorrow. The demand for healthcare is growing 40% faster than our ability to raise revenue to support the growth of, of, of the taxation base, to fund healthcare. So, Actuaries, um, there's a doomsday, there's a doomsday, there always is with actuaries. They say in the next 20 years that um, we're going to drive this healthcare spend and those lines separating healthcare and GDP are going to be such that we're going to bankrupt the provinces as the provinces, the biggest four provinces in the country I just referred to, start to spend as much as 70% of their total tax revenue supporting healthcare. And so, I don't want to go into this. I think this is a story most of you have heard. You could layer onto it if you want, the Commonwealth Report, and we could ask ourselves, are we getting what we deserve? Are we getting, or could we do better? I think we could. Um, I, I think the Commonwealth Report tells us that we could. Out of 11 countries, uh, we place roughly 10th in the areas of quality, efficiency, access to care, and safety. Uh, I think we can do better. Let's talk about, on this next slide, how we set that up. So I think there's a recognition that the system and um, the healthcare environment that we all work in isn't what we want it to be. And we understand that it can be better. And I think there is a way out. And I brought this metaphor to share out with everybody. Uh, it's not a healthcare metaphor, but I think it's a meaningful metaphor to understand the role of technology in solving this big problem. Now this might be the biggest problem that we've had in the world over the last 50 years. This is a problem that talks about food and scarcity. And this is a problem that if you're over 50 years old or around 50 years old in this room, you might even remember this challenge. And the way that this was framed is that these guys that predict, the guys that predict these doomsday events predicted that by the year 2000, and they did this in 1960 and early 70s, they predicted that by the year 2000, the world would not produce enough food to feed everybody in the world. 
feed the population. And the way they came up with that um, conclusion is they looked at two lines, right? They looked at the food production, the rate of food production, and they looked at the rate of population growth. And what they found was that the rate of population growth during the 60s and 70s was growing at 20%, far exceeding our ability to produce food. So what do we do? Well, what we did is we put technology behind this big problem. And with, within a couple years, 10 years, um, in the 80s and 90s, we focused on innovation, right? So in the innovation came in the form of irrigation, creative irrigation. It came in the form of fertilizers. It came in the form of pesticides, crop varietals. And by the 1990s and into 2000, it was interesting that um, even though the population had doubled over those 30 years, um, our ability to produce food far exceeded our population growth. So the application of technology is interesting. Not only did we, we solve the food issue, so we now grow enough food, it's of a higher quality, and it's less expensive than food was in the 60s and the 70s. So we, with the, innov with the innovation introduction and, and the application of, of the proper uh, innovation, we've solved this major crisis. Now the question is, can we apply the innovation as we know it today and develop the innovation that allows us to do the same thing, to serve more patients, have better outcomes, and do it at a lower cost? Interesting. And because I was prepared for that question, I'm going to share what I've come up with this morning. So this is, a, this is an innovation that I'm familiar with, so there's a lot of them out there. It's an innovation because I'm, uh, our company bought this company in 2015. So this is AMS's green light laser. And green light laser is designed to treat BPH, so benign prostate hyperplasia. And um, it's well studied, as you can see, under the HTA reviews. I kind of cluttered this one up a little bit for you, so I, sorry about that. But it, as you can see, it's well studied um, through OTAC. There was even a meta-analysis done here in the province of Alberta, and they came up with the same findings. And those findings were that the proper application of that technology versus the conventional technology, which is TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate, and transurethral resection of the prostate is essentially a knife where you cut away and debulk the prostate. Green light laser is PVP, so it's photo vaporization of the prostate. Literally uses a green light to vaporize the debulk, the debulk and exercise. And the challenge around the TERP is that patients bleed after that procedure. Patients bleed enough so that they have to stay overnight, sometimes two nights. Um, the, the benefits of that technology is that it's low tech and low cost. The cost of the TERP enabler is $125. The cost of a green light laser, which is high tech, is $850. But when you apply those two technologies into the system, interesting what happens. The TERP becomes about 30% more expensive than the green light. So the green light is a technology that offers patient benefits. It enables more patient access because as OTAC tells us, they, they, when they applied that technology into the Ontario environment, they saved 24, excuse me, 28,000 patient bed days, so it created tremendous efficiencies and extra capacity in the system, and saved $14 million. That's pretty interesting. Better patient outcomes, save $14 million, 28,000 patient days. It's interesting. Yet at the same time, you can imagine how this story plays out. We've got very low penetration, around 25% in Canada. And the reason for that is because of something called the silo effect. So if you put yourself in a urology unit and you, you put urology manager hat on, knowing that urology budgets are flatlined at best, and you're making decisions on behalf of your unit. And you know, this is a very common procedure because this procedure impacts uh, up to 50% of all men at 60 years of age. And 80% of men, if you're fortunate enough to live to 80, 80% of men who are 80. So this is a very common procedure. And we're asking those unit managers to take one of their major procedures and invest the difference between $800 and $125. So what happens is that there's no incentive that unit manager can't capture the value, the system value, in the same way that we've managed to capture it in the Alberta meta-analysis or in the OTAC analysis. 
And so this particular innovative technology that satisfies everything that we want it to, better patient outcomes, um, creating that, that excess access to patients into the system, and saves money. Like, that's perfect. We can adopt it. And we've got other examples of technologies that fit into that area. You know, you probably know of some. So in the orthopedics, orthopedic implants that last longer. It's a different type of cross silo, but it's, it, it's one of those silos where um, if the value extends beyond a 12-month cycle, it's hard to account for. So if you invest in a technology that lasts for five years versus one year, there's no way to account in that calculation to help the people making those decisions to make the right system decision. And I, and I brought some uh, people much smarter than me. In fact, these guys end up being, uh, I'm sure most of us are read, um, Porter and, and Kaplan uh, from, from Harvard. And they've identified this as one of the major challenges. This is one of the big impediments to adopting technology into a system, innovation technology into a system, because it bumps up against those cross silos, those one-year budget cycles, and we're not able to capture and make the right decisions on behalf of the total system, of the total patient life cycle journey. And in their words, you know, the sheer size of this opportunity to reduce healthcare with no sacrifice in outcomes is astounding, right? So that's something for all of us. There, there's a ton of technologies out there. So if we're looking at ways to slow down the growth of this healthcare, instead of cutting, I propose to you that we look at these types of innovative technologies and we do it efficiently, and we drive the value and the bounty of, of the benefits to patients, and we do it at a lower cost. As I mentioned before, do you remember the slide where we talked about that $20 billion, and I mentioned before that there's different jurisdictions, countries competing for those $20 billion. I want to share with you something I, th I think you'll find interesting. It's, it's four different scenarios on this four panel of different countries and how they're trying to attract multinational investments into their space, right? And if, if you agree that those big investments from multinationals can be an enabler in the betterment of patient, the betterment of academia, and set us up for a stronger future healthcare, that's why they're doing it. The first example here is Sweden. So Sweden seems to be leading the area of transformation, theoretical transformation, but they're doing something about it. They've attracted the likes of Harvard, they've attracted the likes of Boston Consulting, and they've created this partnership around something called ICHOM, so the International Consortium of Health Outcome Measurements. Many of you are familiar with that group. So much of the thinking around how to optimize the treatment of patients through that patient life cycle in a care environment is gonna be outlined by this group. They've already completed 12 standard sets, which is that, that optimized patient pathway, and they're working on more, and they'll share that with the world. So this is something that Sweden's doing to attract companies like mine to invest huge so that we can tap into the information and knowledge that they have. We've already set up at Boston Scientific an opportunity to partner with Accenture. We'll be working on a, health, a heart failure initiative to try to reduce the cost associated with heart failure and the transfer from patients from hospital in, into home care and how we take care of those patients. So, and we'll be doing that in coordination and in partnership with this group. So they're attracting everybody. They're, they've really got our attention. Germany, uh, another example. They've done it differently. Germany is known to adopt technologies quickly. And we're intrigued by that. Germany, when you launch a new technology, Germany goes fast and deep um, with penetration into their markets. We learn very quickly through that experience. We learn very quickly about the patients. We learn very quickly about their care system. And, and we learn very quickly on how to launch these products into other jurisdictions. So Germany has benefited from that. A lot of physicians behind the podium in Germany. There's been lots of uh, uh, center of excellence initiatives. So Germany's really attracted a ton of investment by that strategy. Australia, different approach again. Australia just came on. I saw the original soundbite here in 2014 where Australia made mention of the fact that they're going to differentiate their ability to track, even though they didn't call it this. I'm looking at this saying, oh, my God, that sounds like a good place to be. They've lowered the hurdles, the regulatory hurdles, to get in and do some of that early clinical work in Australia. And it just came out again in September of 2016 of this year, and they called out some of the objectives that they're trying to accomplish 
by lowering those hurdles without sacrificing pa patient safety, by the way. They're going to speed up access to innovative devices. So they're going to lower those regulatory hurdles to get innovative devices in the hands of the care providers and treating patients. They're going to leverage assessments by overseas regulators, so they're going to use data from other respected jurisdictions to help get those products approved quickly. And then they're going to create exceptions if they need to. So this is an interesting approach. I'm not saying that this is the approach that I recommend for Canada, but my point here is that countries have strategies. They have strategies to get at those big uh, multinational investment opportunities. And these are, these are strategies that appear to be working. The last one is an interesting one. It's a small country, Denmark. And it's interesting what, they, what, what they've come up with. Um, and, and I got this information from one of Les Levine's summit. He invited some international guests, and one of the guests was talking about Denmark. And in this case, in certain specific areas, Denmark creates a funding, a pot of funds to support the adoption of innovation. So they take current sales, they park some of those sales, and they use that as uh, an innovation adoption accelerator. So it's an, interesting, it's an interesting strategy. The other thing that they've done, and I think this is really quite creative, do you know how we have key account managers, so industry has key account managers, and those key account managers manage specific named hospitals. It's our job to understand the hospitals and drive value and connect. They've done just the opposite. They've got hospital administrative key account managers who target uh, multinational companies, big companies, to attract and pull in and to entice those companies to invest in their hospitals. Interesting approach. Sort of all that, this is my favorite one. Who in the room's heard of uh, Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister of Japan? I think most people watching the news they may have heard of Shinzo. Um, this is an interesting case study in my mind. Um, and I think they've got something that's really, really cool. What Shinsu did is he built a health solution to solve an economic challenge. So in 2012, when Shinsu was re-elected as Prime Minister of Japan, Japan had a flat line economy, no growth. It was the poorest growth in the industrial world um, at that time. He also had another problem. He had an aging population that he knew if this population were to retire, that he would have a massive social system problem. So he set out to solve that problem to make a healthier Japanese population even though they were getting older. In other words, keep them working longer. So in 2012, um, there was a Japanese scientist who was awarded a Nobel Prize, a Nobel laureate for the area of regenerative medicine, which is interesting. And so a year later, Shinsu announced an opportunity for Japan to put their shoulders behind and create a cluster. He committed to investing a billion dollars over 10 years, and then he lowered the regulatory hurdles as well. So what he said to international industries, he said, if you come to Japan and you do your clinical work in Japan in the area of regenerative medicine, which is the stem cell research, et cetera, you do that and I'm going to make you go through safety and efficacy, but then I'm going to stop there. And you can do your HTA and your effectiveness and your effectiveness in the marketplace after, after that point, after the safety and efficacy uh, boxes have been checked. So that allowed regenerative medicine companies to enter into the Japanese market commercially after three years versus seven years. So what do you think happened? You get access to the Japanese market after three years versus seven years in the traditional model. It attracted a ton of international investment. It attracted a ton of big Japanese companies that started working with the Japanese SMEs. There was purchases of those big companies of the SMEs. And Based on that small investment of a billion dollars, this space now, experts believe, will grow in the next less than 15 years to $30 billion cluster of regenerative medicine and continue to grow. So it's become an economic engine in the area of innovative medical devices. And it all started with a, with a really interesting idea and, and, uh, and a lot of motivation to not only solve a healthcare challenge, but to drive his economy. So I think this is a, it's an absolutely interesting 
um, metaphor. So solve this thing and become prosperous doing it. And I think that uh, Shinzu did a lot for us in, in, in creating that lesson for the rest of the world. So this is my last slide. So I've talked a lot about winning uh, versus not losing. As I mentioned before, I think Alberta is best positioned, certainly best positioned in Canada to take advantage of the strategy I've outlined, and that strategy is using innovative technologies to attract investment at the same time, improving patient outcomes, providing access to more patients um, to the healthcare system, and saving money by doing it. So th there's, there's a huge advantage when you do this correctly. And I mentioned that I believe that, that Alberta can do that and really attract a ton of investment from um, the, the multinationals. Here's the other reason I believe that Alberta is well positioned. We've got basically one headwind, I believe, in front of this province. And that headwind is figuring out how do we remove the friction, how do we, as an entity, learn how to uh, select the right innovative technologies, how do we learn how to responsibly adopt those for the betterment of patients and the betterment of the system, and then get moving on, on, on driving um, innovation into the healthcare system in Alberta. That's the piece that's missing. And the great news is that you're taking great steps through the uh, uh, SCN Medic Initiative to solve that big problem. You solve that big problem and the rest are tailwinds. You've got here in Alberta close proximity to the US. American companies would love, instead of having to fly to Germany or having to fly to Australia on a monthly basis to, to review their clinical work, would love to come to Canada, which is an hour away from uh, Minneapolis or Boston, uh, the two big hubs where, where a lot of this innovation takes place. We've got a great culture here in Canada. We're easy to work with. There's no language barriers in this country, so it's easy for Americans to work in Canada, um, and they like working with Canadians. We've got a devalued currency. This is a real boon for us. This is, we've got a 30% competitive advantage on many of these other jurisdictions that we're competing with. We can play that card. They can get more value from working with Canadians. Well-known academic centers, the branding around our academic centers are second to none. We've got great researchers, fantastic doctors. We've got so much going for us in this country, and we just haven't done a great job of pulling those investments through into this environment. We could be a bigger player, much bigger player than we are today. And ethnic, ethnic diversity, um, huge. We've got one of the most diverse ethnic populations in the world. This is really, really important when you talk about research and science. They can come to Canada and get a cross-section of a lot of different folks. This is a really big, really big advantage. So in summary, um, I want to thank you very much for listening to me rant up here. You can tell I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate because I think you guys, the people in this room, can be a bigger part of uh, setting a tone for Canada and setting a pace and shaping the healthcare uh, environment uh, for the future in a way that we'll be proud of it. We'll be proud of the healthcare environment that we shape today if we do the right things. So with that, uh, again, I want to thank you and, and, I'll, and I'll close. Thank you very much. So Ken, thank you very much for that. Um, we do have mics uh, here for questions, but um, I'll kick it off. And oh. Ken, uh, thank you very much for your gracious words about Alberta and you know, the momentum that we have here. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with the strength of sort of the collaborative system around us. You know, we've got the ministry behind us. We've got strong support from management at uh, Alberta Health Services and the Strategic Clinical Networks. So it's come together in Alberta, and we've got some good leadership there. The question that I have for you, though, is as you're looking at challenges in Canada, and yes, Alberta's got a little bit of momentum, what are some of the key things that you see, even in Alberta, that are key challenges that we need to overcome to get to sort of that vision that you're talking about? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I think I tried to cut on, on uh, sort of comment on that. I think the big one, I think the big one is, is um, cracking that code on taking the friction out of the adoption of innovation. But while you mentioned it, Reg, and I, I appreciate the, the question, 
because it does give me the opportunity to compliment the government here. I have to say that's one of the things that, that I'm surprised about and, in, and you're unique in this way. I think the government's showing great courage to come out and work within the SEN environment and share the challenges in front of it. You know, I think that's the, the, one of the first steps to creating solutions to some of these challenges is, is for the government entities to have that courage and want a dialogue and want a partner around solutions that are available to it. So uh, I, th I think that's one of the things that really makes Alberta special. So that's one of the reasons I, I believe that there's, there's tailwind, uh, Reg, for, for the environment here. And, and I think you're also, you're a Boy Scout here in Alberta compared to the rest of the country, certainly from a debt perspective, you've got a strong financial house. I know you're going to go into debt a little bit this year. Uh, you burned through the Heritage Fund, but you're still only $10 billion in debt if you take a look at Ontario. So if you want to you take a look at Ontario, Ontario's got a $300 billion debt, half of uh, the, the, the country's debt, and Ontario now can claim to have the largest sub-sovereign debt in the world. So non-country entity, the largest debt in the world, and to service that $300 billion debt, um, they spend about $11 billion, half of what they spend on education. So by comparison, you can understand, by comparison, Alberta's done a very nice job, and I think that's another reason that you're set up well. Hi, Ken. Uh, Gerald Cole from the University of Calgary. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is I, I'm, I'm really sorry the Oilers lost last night. <coughs> um, <laughs> but... <laughs> So I work with biomedical engineering at UC, and we are sort of very actively involved in fest, had some great meetings this week, how we're trying to piece together a technology development pipeline. And one of the things that does get talked about, certainly the startup companies, but how do we engage with large companies? So I have a couple questions, just in a more detailed level of how Boston Scientific operates, because you talked about investing um, certainly from what I see, I tend to see startup companies getting VC money, eventually building things up, and then acquisition happening, um, which is different. And, and I don't know. I don't see whether you are getting involved earlier in investing. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious if you could just go into a little more detail around that. It's such an interesting question. I can offer you... Um I'll stop short of the answer, but I can give you my perspective because I don't know what the answer is. From our perspective, and I, and I think I share this perspective with most of multinationals, is that we've tended to bias um, when we're looking at um, startups. We tend to bias on startups that have a very strong revenue stream already. So if you've got $100 million, you know, we're going to pay a lot for you, but that's, that, that technology is already proven and but I think it's a different question, and I think as multinationals, we need to look at this a little bit differently. And that's why I'm so excited about attracting uh, multinationals into an ecosystem and, and creating a cluster, because I think it, that's how we're going to build, I think, a, a healthy SME environment and give them the shot in the arm that they need, because there's some really great ideas. In fact, I was in Boston uh, at a meeting, um, and in fact, Mel was there, Jason Ding, and a few other folks from this area were there. And um, the, the nature of, of, of this presentation through mass device, uh, so I was in the room representing Boston Scientific, um, these investors would come up behind the podium, investor after investor, and the ideas were intriguing. The ideas were really intriguing, but there's, there's sort of the, the, the challenging part of that, and, and I guess it was almost, yeah, I felt bad in, in a sense that, you know, idea after idea came to the podium and they were almost all out of money. So they'd done a lot of clinical work and it's time to start creating prototypes or it's time to start commercializing and their burn rate had used up all their money. And, and so as organizations like mine, um, we need that quick, as you saw, that, that whole innovation cycle, that three, we need quick wins. So we're willing to pay more for innovations that are already proven. Um, but I, I think that I would love to engage more because I think the SMEs need a stronger advocate from the MEs. And, and I think that we, as a Canadian entity and as an Alberta entity, have to do much more to support because that's our future. I think that's the future. I think that's how we really make a statement 
uh, on the future of, of health care in this country. So um, I know I came woefully short on answering your question, but no, uh, I, I talked to some great. of those. I, I just wanted to extend a little bit just for my, in, in my specific area. I know one of the things we run into at the university is there, there is interest in just getting noticed by some of the larger multinationals. And some of that, frankly, is simply that some of our graduates can get access to those first entry jobs. And it's difficult being in Canada, since um, you know your company is a great example, parent companies in the US. Um, do you have any recommendation on just how to tie into that and how to just start getting noticed at the university level of some of the work that we're doing and the, the HQP that we're producing? You know, I'm going to give you a, this room a compliment, another compliment on what you've done, because I think part of the solution lies in what you've done already with the SCN. I, I think you've, in, in, in a way that no other region has done as effectively, is they've engaged a lot of different stakeholders. And I think the power in those various perspectives um, can provide us a, a, an answer to some of those questions you're asking. I don't think that uh, industry holds the answer to that. Uh, but I think it's a collective of uh, various stakeholders. I think if we put our minds to it, and we came to the question by asking, how do we win? How do we all win collectively in this environment? And, and, and we put specific action items around, and then we commit to following through. I think that's a big part of, of what we can do. Thank Great you. questions. Thank you. Hi, Ken. Thanks again. Great speech. So I was. Thinking about this idea, especially with SMEs, we seem to invest a lot of money in the front half. So there's innovation funds, Western innovation, but we've designed success almost, you've got an idea, now get it out of here. We need to use it some other place. So is that just typical to Canada? Do you see that other places? And how do we overcome sort of getting through that, the, the back half, we're getting investment in the back half so we get that adoption through the system for everything we put up front? Uh, again, really interesting question, and I, I think part of that answer um, is related to, you know, I think the response I just gave. I, I, I think that we haven't solved for that. Um, I would agree with you. In the question, there's there's a, an underscoring that this is an important thing to get our arms around. I, I get that. Um, I also get the fact that we don't have the answers today. And, and to point to international clusters that are succeeding, um, there are some. There are some. Um, but it takes a commitment versus an interest in those areas to make those things survive and, and, and thrive. You know, I, I think that one of the things that we do probably too often is, is we focus on the supply side of the economic equation. So we create all this innovation and then we put them out there and these, these small SMEs come to a marketplace where there's no money. And I think you've heard the story before where they come out, even if they have a good idea, they go outside of Canada to commercialize because their ideas aren't accepted here in Canada. So um, I think that there's opportunities to support them better. I, I really do. I, I think that we've made some of those decisions in the past, decisions that don't make economic sense. I think wind power and solar power are things that, you know, we've made those um, social um, uh, priorities. They don't make economic sense today, but we made those social priorities for the future. So we're willing to spend more today for our future. I think that's one metaphor, again, that we could use in the support of SMEs. We need to support them today because that could be the future. Now, we need to put regulations and guardrails around that so that we spend appropriately and we invest appropriately, but I think it's, it's probably a step in the right direction. I don't know if I answer your question. Have I drained the oxygen out of the room? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So again, Ken, uh, Ken uh, on behalf of uh, Alberta Innovates, Board of Directors, Institute of Health Economics, we really do thank you for speaking with us today. A uh, very inspiring talk and uh, some points for us to think about. So thank you very much. For those of you who might have noticed, there are some cameras in the back. So all of these sessions are recorded. Uh, so if you'd like to go back and capture a couple of uh, Ken's fine words there that you missed, they're on videos recorded. They're put on our website. We haven't migrated everything over to the Alberta Innovates website yet, so it's on the old AIHS website for now. And uh, please stay tuned for the 2017 roster, which will be coming up pretty soon. John, was there anything else that uh, uh, we need to say? No. Nope.
Sorry, yeah, so it's on the IHE website as well. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>